Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Edna Zhe. And I'm Raymond Yang. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Talks are underway in Shenzhen on the controversial issue of immigration checkpoints for the express railway to Guangzhou. Cathay Pacific cabin crew protest for the second day over dispute involving salary and working conditions. The police commissioner rejects claims Beijing is telling him how to run the Hong Kong police force. Talks are underway on the controversial issue as to just where immigration checkpoints should be located once the express railway to Guangzhou opens in 2017. Just as Secretary Rimsky Yun said any agreement must be legal under the basic law. Just as Secretary Rimsky Yun and Transport Secretary Anthony Zheng were in Shenzhen this morning for discussions with officials from the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office following an outcry that mainland immigration officials should not be located on the Hong Kong side. Some legislators had voiced concerns that such arrangements would infringe the one country, two systems principle. The officials on both sides today met to exchange ideas on just how the border clearance arrangements can be in place once the express rail link to Guangzhou opens by the end of 2017. Speaking after the meeting, Yun said both sides had agreed that one single immigration checkpoint for passengers should be set up, instead of creating facilities at each side of the border. The progress of today is reasonably good, it's very constructive, and uh, as I was saying just now in Cantonese, uh, we uh, agree that the uh, ultimate uh, co-location arrangement should be uh, properly put in place with proper legal basis by the time the railway is to commence uh, operation uh, towards the end of 2017. Yun added that the immigration checkpoint must be within the framework of the basic law. It's of utmost importance that the future design would not be inconsistent with the uh, basic law and it is every intention of the uh, Hong Kong government as well as the Central People's Government to have the arrangement under the umbrella of the basic law. An executive councillor and lawmaker Jeffrey Lam gave his thumbs up for the proposed single checkpoint. Uh, to set an area for the mainland officers uh, to operate immigration customs and quarantine uh, procedures in Hong Kong, uh, I think is uh, workable. Uh, as we can, uh, we can see in different countries, uh, such as in Canada and in the United States, in the United Kingdom and France and Belgium, they are all doing this. MTR Corporation Chairman Raymond Chan also welcomed plans for a single checkpoint. From our project management perspective, okay, the sooner that can be decided, the better it is. Chen dismissed as speculation recent reports that the construction for the high-speed rail link would soar from $65 billion to $90 billion. I think any figure that you hear outside that is reported in the media and all that is really speculative. Okay? And uh, I think just have some patience. Uh, and by the end of June, uh, we're going to have something that we're quite confident about and we're going to share with the public and the government, of course, first. Chen added that the company was still reviewing the cost of completing the mega project. The express link was originally scheduled to open this year, but was pushed back by two years after the railway company blamed difficult ground conditions for the delay. Cathay Pacific cabin crew have protested for the second straight day over a dispute involving salary and working conditions. They have also rejected the management's explanation that it is all a misunderstanding and want of a full-fledged industrial action in August if their demands are not met tomorrow. Sticking to their threat, around 100 Cathay Pacific cabin crew members continued their marathon sit-in at the airport for a second day running. Unionist lawmakers Li Chek-an and Sit Ho also showed up to rally behind the group. The Cathay Pacific Flight Attendants Union is up in arms following a series of cost-cutting measures imposed by the company last month. The union accuses the company of silently deleting a clause on its operation manual, which guarantees legal protection for crew members who are on duty. Staff fear they will have to bear all legal costs should disputes arise in the future. But the airline's chief executive, Ivan Chu, insists it is a misunderstanding. 
We are concerned that our, our, some of our, our uh, uh, the staff are not happy. So we want to uh, sort of some misunderstanding. The issues is very much the, the legal support issue. Of, of course, uh, as, a government, as a company, we would uh, support our, our staff, but I think there is a misunderstanding there. But the management seems to be standing firm on other demands, including reversing its decision to reduce meal allowance for one of its stops. Last month, the company slashed the allowance for the Australian city of Melbourne from $368 to $215, but was later adjusted to $337 after fierce opposition. The meal allowance is regarded as one of the main income sources for flight attendants. On the issue of the Melbourne allowance, we regularly do reviews on, on the food and beverage costs of of different ports which Cathay fly to, and if those menu prices come up or down, we will adjust accordingly. Another cost-cutting measure involves around 200 crew members who are due an automatic pay rise this year when they switch to permanent contracts. But they have been offered the hourly rate of $159, which is 10% lower than the $177 that current staff are receiving. After uh, they've served three years, we sign up a new contract. We offer a double-digit increase. So uh, that is done with uh, detailed research of the, the market environment. And what we are keen to make sure we achieve is to deliver a market competitive salary package to our, to our staff. We, and we do expect uh, most, the majority, absolute majority of our staff will sign up to the new contract because it is a market competitive contract. She added the management is ready to talk and iron out differences. But union chief Dora Lai rejected the arguments, saying she's heard them before. She warned the union may step up their action tomorrow if the company does not come up with a concrete response. Any work to rule or strike in August, the summer peak season will definitely deal Hong Kong's flagship carrier a big blow. Labor chief Matthew Cheng said the government is closely monitoring the situation adding the department is ready to mediate any time. The, the police, police commissioner. The police commissioner has rejected claims Beijing is telling him how to run the Hong Kong police force. Stephen Lowe said his meeting in the capital was to maintain close contact with his mainland counterparts in light of the increase in cross-border crimes. Arthur Ercula reports. Speaking in Beijing at the end of his four-day visit, his first since taking up his new post, Police Commissioner Stephen Lowe faced probing questions about his meeting yesterday with security chief Meng Jianju. The meeting with Meng took place without the media being informed and was only reported afterwards through state media. This raised questions that Lowe was receiving orders from the central government on how to run the police force in Hong Kong. But Lowe today denied this and explained it was a courtesy visit without prior arrangements to brief top officials on the security situation here. The police chief said he hopes to maintain close contact with the central authorities, pointing out that there had been a number of criminal cases here involving mainland suspects. Lowe also vowed to uphold political neutrality and be impartial in handling his duties. On the recent case in which a man with autism was wrongfully arrested, in connection with the murder of an elderly man in Sha Tin, Lowe said an internal review was already underway. He also said the man's family had been contacted, but the police commissioner stopped short of saying whether it was to apologize. On the issue of seven officers who allegedly beat up Civic Party activist Ken Sang during last year's Occupy protests, Lowe said that police had finished their investigation and were awaiting directions from the Justice Department. Asked about reports that the police were carrying out large-scale drills in preparation for demonstrations, Lowe denied the force was gearing up for any upcoming protests in particular. There's speculation that officers are preparing for clashes with demonstrators sometime in June, when the government's political reform proposal is expected to be voted on by lawmakers. Arthur Ricciola, ATV News. Disciplinary action may be taken against any official who breached procedures while building the Civil Aviation Department's new headquarters. Chief Secretary Carrie Lam issued the warning after an audit commission report found that the department spent public money on facilities without getting formal approval. Chief Secretary Carrie Lam gave the stern warning this morning during a Legislative Council's Public Accounts Committee meeting. 
Lam said the Transport and Housing Bureau is currently examining the report submitted by the Director General of Civil Aviation, and the government will follow up on the issue, including taking appropriate administrative or disciplinary action if any misconduct is found. Lam admitted that the Civil Aviation Department had handled the project inappropriately, although the headquarters did serve its need and was built within its budget. The department was granted $2 billion in 2008 to build an office measuring around 700,000 square feet. According to the Audit Commission, the department spent $97 million on furniture and equipment. More than $67 million was shelled out for security and electronic systems without the approval of the Financial Services and Treasury Bureau. The report blamed the extravagant bill on the installation of costly LCD monitors in rooms and venues already equipped with less sophisticated video display units. In February, the PAC lambasted the action of the department's director, General Norman Lowe, who was said to have deliberately overridden the Property Vetting Committee and the Financial Services and the Treasury Bureau when building the headquarters. Police have arrested a man who bought three cars online worth $780,000 using bad checks. All three sellers who fell victim to the SAM sold their vehicles through the same online forum. Details from Arthur Okeola. Police said the 29-year-old suspect was arrested yesterday for obtaining property by deception. He had managed to buy three cars from people using bad checks. The vehicles were $780,000 have since been recovered. Police said in all three cases, which happened last month, the cars were sold online on a used car forum. Senior Inspector Chu Chi Hun said the suspect would meet the sellers each time to test out the cars and write out bogus checks to pay for them. The suspect would then bank the fake checks and send the sellers a message with a picture of the receipt to convince them he was sincere. The transfer of ownership would be carried out on the same day as the transactions, after the sellers saw their bank balances increase. However, they would only realize they had been duped when the checks later bounced. Police believe the suspect intended to resell the cars for a hefty profit. Arthur Urquiola, ATV News. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has had to cancel a trip to a North Korean industrial estate after Pyongyang withdrew its invite. But first, in our roundup of international news, the former top U.S. diplomat Hillary Clinton is struggling to shake off scandals. Ben Rock reports. Former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton visited a bicycle shop in Iowa while out campaigning for next year's presidential election as the Democratic Party's most likely candidate. But reporters were more interested in talking about scandals plaguing Clinton than bikes, specifically a judge ordering the State Department to release emails from when she was in charge. Critics say the emails will prove Clinton and the rest of President Barack Obama's administration lied about a militant attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, Libya. But Clinton insists otherwise. Because I think it will show how hard we worked and what we did um, for our country during the time that I was Secretary of State, where I worked extremely hard on behalf of our values and our interests and our security. Um, and the emails are part of that. So I have said publicly, I'm repeating it here in front of all of you today, I want them out as soon as they can get out. Four Americans died when the consulate was hit by militants on the 11th of September 2012 in a coordinated revenge attack for a drone strike on al-Qaeda. At the time, the facility was being used by the CIA to smuggle weapons to Syrian rebels. But for two weeks after they knew the facts, Clinton and other officials blamed protesters angry about an anti-Muslim film posted on the Internet. In Japan, the governor of Okinawa has renewed calls for the U.S. to remove its base from the island amid ongoing protests from locals. Takeshi Anaga told the press today that the Japanese government should remove the facility as Okinawa had been burdened by a heavy U.S. troop presence since the Second World War. The island is home to around 25,000 troops and residents are often complaining about crime, noise, sexual assaults and other issues that they blame on the Americans. The U.S. has suggested moving the base to another part of the island, but locals want it removed completely. 
Onaga is planning to visit the U.S. next week to repeat his message to officials there. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said today that his planned trip to North Korea has been scrapped after Pyongyang retracted its invitation. Early this morning, the authorities of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea informed us through their diplomatic channel that they were reversing their decision for me to visit the Kaesong Industrial Complex. No explanation was given for this last-minute change. This decision by Pyongyang is deeply regrettable. However, I, as the Secretary General of the United Nations, will not spare any efforts to encourage the DPRK to work with the international community for peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and beyond. Ban would have been the third UN chief to visit the North, and the first since 1993. Ben O'Rourke.